Lowell came to see me in uh, the spring of 1958. And at that time, we had just started a program in congenital heart surgery. Only a few valve cases, but mainly focused on children. And it was the only team in Oregon, and I was up to my eyeballs in clinical work. He had found out about me because I was the only cardiac surgeon at the medical school in Oregon. And uh, his son either was going to medical school or planned to go to medical school. And he was very interested in the circulation and thought we might be able to collaborate on an artificial heart. He had developed a, a mock circulation in his uh, lab. And uh, he felt the circulation was not that much of a hydraulic problem. He suggested an artificial heart, and at that time, uh, we didn't even have artificial valves. So I, I told him that it, it was a good idea. Eventually, we would need one. It's not a fool's errand, but let's do one valve at a time. And if we get all the valves done, then we can go on to a heart. So he, uh, we discussed which valve to start with, and because uh, a mitral valve replacement had never been done using any kind of prosthesis, we, and that was the hardest uh, part, to, the hardest valve to replace, I thought that was what we should do, and so we decided on a mitral valve. I didn't realize at the time that he was driven to, f to, to finish this project, and so within days, he called for another appointment, and we sat down and mapped out the materials and the design of the first prosthesis for implantation in animals. And to the first clinical implant, do you recall what that time frame was? Yes, from the, from the uh, time I met Edwards to the time of the first implant was two years. Well, once the company was formed, then uh, uh, we had uh, numerous uh, consulting meetings in uh, Anaheim, uh, and our project was to uh, take this, the initial valve, which was pretty crude, the, the, the ones put, put in the first few patients, they were handmade in acrylic. Then the next stage was to make them in stainless steel. And then the next stage was to get a, a non-iron containing uh, compound so we would not have to face the issue of corrosion. And so we ended up with Stelli 21. So we had about a five-year period from 1960 to 1965 when there were rapid changes in the geometry of the, of the mitral valve were made. We optimized the cage dimensions. Uh, we made the sewing ring more user-friendly. And we finally, we ended up with a model that we called the uh, 6120. We started out with the model 6000. 6120 was the ultimate mitral that was still in use for uh, many decades uh, following that. And when we went to the aortic, uh, we had to modify that valve to an aortic configuration, which we started working on in 1961. We uh, developed uh, our own center of excellence first, which we had to do. We, uh, there was no uh, intensive care unit when we started. We had to build an intensive care unit. Uh, we had to develop uh, the technique of the surgery itself, not just the valve, but how to put the valve in. We didn't have suture material that was designed for valve replacement. We were using silk sutures, which were not really permanent sutures. Uh, so we had to develop a lot of internal technology, which we did in about three years, from 1960 to 63. Around that time, we got onto the road. And uh, our job with uh, Edwards people was to do demonstration operations all over the place. Well, I think we have to continue to operate in the, in the domain between medicine and engineering. That, that, uh, that's our special place in life, and uh, wherever that might take us uh, in the biological world, so whether it takes us into an artificial heart or uh, some uh, automated uh, methodology in an intensive care unit, it's very hard to predict the future. But one thing I think we know, and that is the special chemistry that occurs when you produce an interface between engineering and medicine is a highly productive space. And that's the space that Edwards Life Sciences occupies now and should continue to occupy as we go forward.